Welcome everybody, pruning deciduous fruit trees with Oren Martin. Thanks for being here tonight. We are going to wait for a few people to show up and that should take three to five minutes. Well, we are at about uh, half of the number of people who registered for the for the course. So uh, let's get started. Thank you, Jessica, who's moving our slides and Oren will be presenting. First, a little from Delise Weir. I am on the board of the Friends of the Farm and Garden and we're your host tonight. So first, some of the typical housekeeping um, information about Zoom. We've all been on a lot of Zooms by this time but you're, you're going to find that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We do want to hear from you though, so please put your questions or comments or anything you want to chat about with the rest of the crowd uh, into the chat and questions should really go into the question and answer button. So those you can find at the bottom of your screen. And um, there's a little button called CC Live Transcript if you have trouble hearing that's a good thing to turn on because it's going to give you closed captioning at the bottom of the screen. If you run any, into any technical problems, you can chat directly with Jessica. She will attempt to fix those for you. And uh, we are going to be showing some videos that are being hosted on YouTube. So there is a chance if you have uh, poor bandwidth or poor connectivity where you are that it will sort of stutter and go slowly. Um, if that happens, let us know. There's not much we can do about it. Uh, but we will be sending out all this information, the presentation, the links to the videos to your email after this class is over. And we bring you these classes. Um, Oren's going to talk us up. <laughs> yeah, um, these classes and in, <clears throat> as I'm calling it, the former times, uh, these classes live and in person at the UCSC Farm and Garden. Uh, <clears throat> are sponsored by our affiliates group, the Friends of the Farm and Garden. And they are friends and then they are friends as well. Uh, they support us in so many of the things we do. They are, were principally, originally, they were formed to support our apprentice program, but they support everything that we do. Um, and so you should think about joining this group for an nominal fee. Uh, as you see on the screen, there are, if you live in the area, there, there are some perks, um, but there's also a quarterly newsletter, chock full of informative articles and news of what's happening in our network. Um, and more than that, when you join the Friends of the UCSC Farming Garden, what you're doing is you're supporting the work that we do, the very important work that we do. In a nutshell, what we do at the Farming Garden through our various programs involving farming and gardening is uh, we're teaching the next generation. We're teaching people to grow plants organically and its applications are many and varied and as small a program as we are in one sense, we're not a land grant university. It has had a profound effect on the food system over 55 years. So you might want to think about supporting that. Thank you, Oren. Um, so we are so lucky to have Oren today. He's been teaching it. Um, it says CASFIS, but we've changed our name. We are now the Center for Agroecology because apparently now people know what agroecology is, and that's a good thing. Um, he's taught thousands of apprentices over the years and uh, interns now, undergraduates. He has an incredible, incredible encyclopedic knowledge of fruit trees and oh, so many other gardening topics. You can read more about him at the link I'm gonna put in your 
in your chat. And um, thank you for teaching, Oren, and thank you for teaching online. We know you hate that. I do. You, you like the humans. <laughs> right. Uh, all right, well, that's a good segue, Delise, thanks. Um, and um, so I guess I would start out by saying, hey, folks, I wish you were here, or more precisely, that we were up there, up there being roaming the UCSC Farms orchard, looking at trees, talking about trees, and pruning trees. But alas, that's not the deal these days. So I got a little shout out here. When you get done with this, maybe you kick back, and sun will already be down. We go out on the porch and look at the starry night. You know, think of Vincent Van Gogh, the starry night, um, and. Uh, maybe open a CAB, a cold adult beverage, and dial up on YouTube a great cover song by an amazing sister musical group, Larkin Poe, as in Edgar Allan, P-O-E. Um, and the song is a cover of uh, Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here, and it's searing. So something to do after the show here. But I wish you were here. And whenever we can get back, when we can have normal assemblage, we'll do it live and in person. Okay, so uh, I usually start these things off with some sort of a quote or a poem or something. And I think last time um, I, I, I did a short Gandhi quote, man of peace, yeah. But a man who also was an advocate for farming and felt in the 1930s and 40s that all farming should be organic. And the quote was something like, to forget how to dig the earth and tend the soil is to forget ourselves. And so I'm gonna pivot off that. I'm gonna read a, a little bit of a quote from another fellow uh, named Wendell Berry, who's also a, a man of peace, uh, a writer, a poet, and a draft horse farmer in Kentucky. Um, and he uh, is a deep thinker. And he says, or he has said at one time, as farmers never tire of saying, you can't learn to farm by reading a book. And you can't tell someone how to farm. Older farmers I knew used to be fond of saying, I can't tell you how to do that, but I can put you where you can learn. And continuing on, he says, there is such a thing then as incommunicable knowledge, knowledge that comes only by experience and association. And I would say, ain't it the truth? Um, the best uh, teaching happens out in the fields and the orchards, and that's what we do. We teach in an apprentice style with apprentices, novices, intermediate uh, students um, uh, from all over the world. Um, and we teach in a very kinetic, active style, side by side with them, trying to explain and impart to them the rudiments of organic farming and gardening. So that's my little intro. Uh, but I guess we should get on with the show. Uh, pruning and training. Now, mind you, um, I use these two terms in tandem. Pruning, the cutting on a tree, and there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Uh, we'll try to shed a little light on that. Uh, and training. Training is the manipulating of branches. And you use the two in tandem to create the shape of the tree you want. And uh, both are valuable. There'll be an attachment here uh, for a little video on, on training. I won't do much of that uh, this evening. So, uh, but let's just take a start by maybe taking a step back before we plunge into it. Um, and I've got a little quip, a little quote from a recently retired uh, after 50 years, a local uh, organic orchardist, uh, Jim Ryder. And I invited him up to talk to the apprentices one year and he started off his pruning talk with this little quip. and. A uh, little laconic, little, little humorous, but kind of right. So uh, Jim said, pruning is a useful skill. It's a lot like driving, another useful skill. But if you don't know where you're going and how to get there, it doesn't do you much good now, does it? So I would swing off of that and say, so where are we going and how are we gonna get there with your fruit trees? Well, we can take that. How are we gonna get there is through pruning and training. And where are we going? What you're trying to do is create a size with pruning and training is to create a size manageable tree. Now that will vary depending on the species. Uh, plums, apricots, cherries are more vigorous than uh, apples and 
pears, but you want a size manageable tree. Uh, maybe if you're lucky with dwarf apples, six to eight feet, more often eight, 10, 12 feet with the stone fruits, plums, uh, prunes, pluots, apricots, and the like. So we want a size manageable tree. And one of the dividends of pruning is when you cut back on a branch, it thickens it and strengthens it. So you want, uh, you, where are we headed? We're headed towards a tree that has a permanent or relatively permanent branch structure, a framework, and one that is mechanically sound and self-supporting so it can hold the weight of the fruit. Um, you're also uh, headed for a tree, of course, that uh, has a good quantity and quality of fruit on an annual basis. Fruit, the object of our desires, as it were. But the big thing you're doing with training and pruning is you're managing sunlight. Uh, you could say that fruit tree growers are simply harvesters of sunlight. You want to create a tree that covers the two main aspects of sunlight management. Interception, that is, you want enough of a tree with branches that go up and out and are well spaced so that sunlight can hit the leaves along the branch. The tree can photosynthesize and produce carbohydrates, mostly sugars, that are used to form every part of the tree and for the energy the tree needs to function and do its work. So you want to create a tree form shape with pruning and training that is conducive to maximum sunlight in, uh, uh, interception. And the second aspect of sunlight management is infiltration. You want branch spacing in such a manner that you get these shafts or corridors or alleys of light into the core of the tree. If you look at a big old 30 foot tree down in Wattsville, big apple tree, the outer shell 20% will have lots of good big fruit. The next 20% in will have some fruit and 60% of that volume in that tree will be fruitless. It takes sunlight and a lot of sunlight striking a branch to make and manufacture fruit buds and support fruit growth. Sunlight doesn't travel more than three, four feet into a fruit tree canopy unaided. And you and I are gonna aid it with pruning and training. Uh, so why don't we, th these are some of the um, topics we hope to get to tonight. And let me acknowledge the total clunkiness of this format that we're stuck mired in here. Uh, I'm sitting at a table. You can't teach, not only can you not learn farming from reading a book, you can't teach pruning from sitting at a table, nonetheless. Um, and um, then I've got words, we've got some slides, and we've got some videos, and we're hoping to just shed a little light, as it were, on uh, the topic. So in order to prune, in order to prune well, you need to know three basic things. And uh, I'll just go over them now, and then we'll go through them with more specific slides. You need to know the bud types on the tree. You need to know what are the types of cuts you're going to make and what's the expected response to those cuts. And you need to know the basic tree forms. There are myriad tree forms. I can think of 25, 30 different tree training forms around the world for different fruits. There's two basic ones we're gonna cover and mostly one of those. The two basic tree forms are the open center or the vase. Everybody take their hand, palm up, and do this. Congratulations, you just formed an open center tree. So you have five main branches that grow up and out and have a nice big opening at the top that allows sunlight in. And the, uh, the second uh, tree form, as you'll see in an ensuing slide here, is the modified center leader, uh, which is basically uh, an isosceles triangle. Okay, let's move on a little bit. But you need to know your buds. There are two basic bud types on fruit trees, uh, vegetative buds and fruit buds. Uh, you could use fruit bud or flower bud interchangeably. Um, uh, here is a, a rendering, uh, an illustration on the left and a photo on the right of some vegetative buds. A vegetative bud will grow either a leaf and or a branch with leaves along its run. Um, and um, vegetative buds are uh, associated largely with the juvenile young years of a tree um, like that. Um, so uh, they occur on all, the only type of bud you have on one year wood. And in the video, I'll delineate 
how you determine how old a branch is in terms of age of wood. The only type of buds you have on one year growth are vegetative buds. Um, as you get into older wood, you have a mix of vegetative buds, but predominantly fruit buds. Let's go to the next slide. Here on the left is a, a rendering. Um, uh, I wrote a book. Uh, it's called Apple Trees. Uh, it's called Fruit Trees for Every Garden. It was published by Ten Speed Press. And I had the pleasure of working with my wife, Stephanie Martin, who's a, a, a printmaker. And she did a lot of the illustrations. And during the course of writing the book, I learned that in the trade, they call these illos. So the illo on the left is uh, an expression of a bunch of different manifestations of fruit buds and on the right a photo of apple uh, fruit buds. So um, fruit buds give rise, uh, uh, so a vegetative bud gives rise to a leaf or a branch with leaves on it. Uh, fruit buds give rise to first a flower and if you get poll pollination occurs a fruit. Um, and sometimes they occur right on the branch or stem and sometimes they occur on little short shoots. But these are some pretty good uh, renderings of what a fruit bud looks like. Fruit buds only occur on two-year-old and older wood on a tree. Um, and um, so you need to know your buds. And the principal reason for this is when you prune on a tree, uh, if you want a branch to grow longer, you need to prune it back to a vegetative bud. So obviously you would need to know where on the tree do vegetative buds occur and what do they look like? And the answer is they occur primarily on one year old wood, all the buds on one year old wood are vegetative. And you cut back to a bud that will regrow the branch. If you wish to stop growth, you cut slightly into older wood and you cut to a fruit bud and that will stop growth. Uh, so you need some bud knowledge. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, and uh, pruning is cutting, cutting on a tree, and there are different types of cuts. Um, and there are two principal cuts. It's a little more complex than that, but we'll try to keep it simple tonight. Um, and uh, uh, if you see on the right, this is again an, an illustration uh, 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 of a, a run of a branch. Um, and if you look at the tip of the branch, you see the slash and the first uh, at the top here, and it's labeled a heading cut into one year old wood. So uh, uh, you make a heading cut by cutting into one year old wood. Um, and you get multiple responses from that. Uh, one is the branch will regrow. Um, and counterintuitive as it seems, the more you cut it back, the harder you cut it back into one-year-old wood, the longer and stronger the regrowth will be in the next season. So in a sense, you could just say, you only need to really ask and answer one question with pruning fruit trees, branch by branch, and the whole tree in the aggregate is, do I want it to grow? And if I want it to grow, I'm gonna head it back, cut it back into one-year-old wood. The more I want it to grow, the more I'll cut it back. But there are some other dividends beyond regrowth, uh, a stimulation uh, from a heading cut. Uh, and that is when you head back a branch, it thickens and becomes more mechanically sound, supports itself. Uh, and that's a good thing. And the other thing, which is critically important, is when you cut back a branch, the next two, three, four, five buds down the stem will break from dormancy and grow weak, lateral, flat branches. Almost all species of fruit bear almost all of their fruit on these weak, flat, lateral branches. So you could say, hey, laterals are our friends. So when you look at a tree, the big wood is structural and the small flat wood is fruitful. Um, okay, and the other type of cut is a thinning cut. It's pretty, as it were, cut and dry. You cut a branch out at its point of origin at the base, it's gone. The expected response is nothing. Again, it takes a bud, a vegetative bud, to uh, grow a branch. So if you cut a branch out, there's no bud there to regrow and you, you should be good. Um, and you use it to, of course, uh, deal with the, uh, the books say the three Ds, the dead disease and damage, I've added a fourth, the disoriented, things going the wrong way. Uh, and, and to get rid of a branch for any reason, it's too vigorous, it's not vigorous enough, it's shading uh, the lower portion of the tree, uh, you thin it out. So if you look, for, before we go on to the next slide, if you look at the whole run of this branch, uh, the top 
uh, bar, red bar indicates a heading cut in one year old wood. And then as we move down the branch into older wood, uh, there's a second uh, slanted red line indicating a shortening cut. A shortening cut is a type of heading cut, but where you cut into slightly older wood, and if you cut to a fruit bud, it has a suppressing or stopping nature. Uh, the branch will not grow. Again, it needs a vegetative bud to grow a branch. So you can stop growth when it's reached the, either the width or the height you want by cutting slightly into older wood to an express fruit bud, uh, and it's called a shortening cut. And then there's another cut uh, a, a type of heading cut, and I'm always hesitant to bring it up because then people see a need to do it all the time, and in truth, you rarely do it. And it's called a renewal cut. So you see moving down this branch again, a renewal cut is where you take an established branch, maybe it's four, five, six, seven, eight feet long, five, six years old, and it's been good, it's borne fruit, but it's starting to shade that which is below it. But you kind of would like a branch there, but not so much of a branch. So you cut it back to a stub. It could be four inches, it could be 10 inches, it's non specific, just to a stub. And the net result from that is that that branch will regrow somewhat moderately over a three or four year period. And then at the base of this branch, you see a thinning cut, cutting a branch out at its point of origin. So there are heading cuts and there are thinning cuts. Heading cuts into one-year-old wood stimulate growth. Let's go to the next slide here. And this is a, a rendering of um, what you're gonna get as per how much you cut off the branch. Again, to me, at the outset, and even as we speak this evening, it's counterintuitive. Uh, I, I, I ride around town on my bike, I peek over fences, not like that. I see people pruning their trees and I see them with a tall tree and they go, ah, I'll just cut it back a lot. Sometimes I'll actually stop to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you might not want to do this and, and here's why. So uh, to the heading cuts here, uh, the more you cut back a branch into one year old wood, the longer and stronger the regrowth will be. Uh, so if you do nothing to a branch, it'll just grow maybe millimeters. If you cut it back maybe a quarter of its uh, uh, length, between a quarter and 50%, uh, it's a moderately stimulating cut. It'll grow maybe a foot or so. If you cut it back 50% or more, that's a very stimulating cut. Again, the more you take off, the stronger the regrowth. So you want to think about, the do I want this branch to grow? Yes. Okay, I'm going to head it back. A lot or a little? Yeah, moderately. I'll head it back moderately. A lot, I'll head it back quite a bit. Okay. Oh, let me just say another thing uh, that buds, the bud that you cut back to, the vegetative bud in this case with a heading cut, buds are uh, pointers or directional arrows. So, what is the direction that the bud that you cut to, the top bud remaining, is pointing? That will be the direction of the resumption of growth. So generally you cut to an under facing or an outward facing bud because you want that growth to continue out and up into the light. Okay, next. Thinning cuts, here's an example on the left, here's an example on the right. And it is important to make a clean cut, not to leave much of a stub. Uh, if you look at the base of a branch, you'll see this ringing, it's called the collar. And you wanna cut to the collar uh, but and not leave an appreciable stub. Uh, that would be a renewal cut. So where you wanted to get rid of a branch by thinning, you would have renewed it and it's gonna regrow again. So cut to the collar, next. Um, in order to do pruning well, you need good tools. Uh, you need good tools that are sharp. There is a, a somewhere in this, uh, oh, look, right here, uh, a, a, a nice 15, 20 minute thing. I go over the arsenal of tools and what they do and how to use them in the orchard and, and it can edify you, I'm sure. Uh, but you wanna get uh, quality tools and keep them sharp. And then this rendering here, uh, uh, the illustration is about how to make a, a cut. You wanna cut slightly above the bud that you want to be your top bud. You leave a stub, maybe a quarter, eighth, half an inch, even though it's bad English, it don't matter. But you leave a stub and the reason for this is you usually get a little desiccation and die back or dry back. And if you cut tight to the bud, it could desiccate and kill the bud. So you leave a stub. And then 
you cut, as you see here, at about a 45 degree angle. And that's for uh, allowing uh, water or irrigation water or rain, rain water uh, overhead sheds away from and not into the bud. This is particularly important in wet years. Y'all remember when it used to rain in the winter in Santa Cruz uh, and also in areas that have uh, uh, considerable uh, precipitation in the summer. So that's how you make a cut. Next. Okay, I'm going to shut up and let you listen to me. <laughs> this is kind of a run through of what what I just said yeah, you know yeah what he said so let's see how it goes it's about 15 18 minutes I think um, and then we'll come back and we'll open it up to questions In order to prune and to prune well, you need to know the bud types on fruit trees. There are two basic bud types, vegetative buds and fruit buds. A vegetative bud will grow either a leaf and or a branch that has leaves along it. A fruit bud will give rise to first a flower and then fruit if it gets pollinated. Let's look on this tree here and look first at the vegetative buds. So from my finger up to the extent of the branch, this section of branch contains only vegetative buds. This is one, this is one, this is one, this is one. Let's look at this one to visually describe it. It is pointed, it is slender, and it is clasped tight to the stem. Okay, now let's look at, talk about fruit buds. Let me show you a few different manifestations of fruit buds. This is a fruit bud, this is a fruit bud, this is a fruit bud, and this is a lateral branch with a bunch of fruit buds. But let me describe first the visual nature of fruit buds. They are plump, they are fat, they are round, and they protrude out from the stem. Again, they could be right on the stem, at the end of a short shoot, or even better, at the end of a mid-size length lateral. Why this is good is because you have a number of fruit buds along this six inch run. Fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud. Okay, there's a little more involved in this, wouldn't you know it? And that is, where on the tree, on what age wood, do the various fruit buds occur? And it's pretty basic. Vegetative buds, all the buds on one-year-old shoots are only vegetative. If we look here, you can see this little pruning wound. This indicates that this branch was pruned here last winter. Why? Because we wanted it to grow. To make a branch grow, you head it back or cut it back, and you leave a little stub. So this branch grew from here to its tip last year, a good growth response. All the buds on one-year-old wood are only vegetative buds. So you go looking for vegetative buds, look at one-year-old wood. Um, I might add that, uh, that when the selection was made as per which bud to prune this to last year, we picked a bud that was under facing or outward facing so that the growth of the branch would be up and out into the light and in this instance with an open center tree it keeps the center of the tree open to sunlight. So one-year-old wood contains only vegetative buds and then by looking at the nature of the wood, not just that it's apical or tip uh, of, the, of the branch, but it's thinner, it's more bronzy, uh, and more lively looking, I'm going to say. You see the pruning stub here? Everything down below this is two-year-old and older wood. Let me characterize its nature. It's thicker, it's browner, grayer, older, and it has almost only veg, uh, sorry, fruit buds here. Um, uh, and so you look for vegetative buds primarily on one-year-old wood and fruit buds on two-year-old and older wood. Uh, 
I'm going to make a heading cut on this branch. Let's talk about heading cuts and their effect. And let's execute one. You get three main responses for making a heading cut. Again, let's define it. A heading cut is any cut made into one year old wood. The response is the branch will regrow. The more you cut the branch back, the stronger and longer the growth response will be. Let me point with my clippers here in that regard. Nice branch. If I leave it alone, it won't grow much. It'll set up fruit. If I prune it a little, let's stipulate about 25% of last year's growth, it'll grow maybe a foot. You get to the point of about 50% of last year's growth, and that becomes a very stimulating cut. If I cut here, it'll grow maybe 18 inches. If you really, if a branch is lagging, but it's healthy, it's just not growing a lot, and you really need a growth response from it, cut it back. Cut it back all the way to even one bud. And that should do the trick and probably catch it up. In this instance, maybe grow two plus feet like that. So that's the primary effect for making a heading cut. There are a couple of secondary tertiary uh, results, and then I'll make a heading cut. When you cut a branch back, i.e. headed, it thickens it and strengthens it thus enabling it to bear the weight, the weight of the wood, the weight of the fruit, be self-supporting, mechanically strong. These are all good things. The third effect is that it induces the formation of fruit buds, both on the main stem, but even better, on short and intermediate laterals. Laterals, how important are they? Well, almost all species of fruit bear almost all their fruit on laterals, thus really important. Let's look at one here in terms of its manifestation and expression of fruit buds. This nice lateral, it's about six, seven inches long, and we've got one, two, three, four, and five fruit buds, either fully formed or on the road to being fruit buds. Now you can't carry four or five fruits along this six, seven inch stretch, but you can carry a couple. Having more fruit buds, which equals more flowers, gives you more pollen, which gives you a greater chance of good pollination and a good crop. So I've got a number of possibilities here, and I'll just let them roll. See which get pollinated and set fruit, and then I'll thin. Maybe carrying two, one, and two along this run. And that'll give me a couple big, fat, juicy, sweet apples. Now there's no qualitative difference in the fruit that's born on a single fat fruit bud on the main stem or on a long slender six inch shoot. However, you will have more fruit buds on a longer shoot. Again, one, two, three, four express fruit buds on this stem. It's good. Let's now make a heading cut. And one of the things in, in a sense you could say with pruning, you only have to ask and answer one question and you better get it right. Uh, and that is, do I want this branch to grow or not? If I want it to grow, I head it back. The more I want it to grow, the harder I head it back again into one year old wood. So. I'm going to ask and answer the question, do I want this branch to grow further? I do. I like another couple, three feet of extension growth with a nice lateral framework 
behind the lead bud. So I'm going to prune it. I'm going to prune it about half its length. And here's a nice bud here to prune to. And in general, think of buds as pointers or directional arrows. The direction that the bud you cut to is pointing is the direction of regrowth. In general, you cut to either what is called an under-facing bud or an outward-facing bud. I want this growth to be up and out and into the light, keeping the interior of the tree in the light. And so I'm going to make a cut here. Let's do that again. Let me steady the branch and make a cut. Okay. What did I do? Well, I headed it back. I headed it back quite a bit. I headed it to a bud facing in an outward direction. Could also be called an underfacing bud. And I left a little stub, quarter inch, eighth inch, half an inch, it don't matter. Leave a stub. The reasoning being that uh, you tend to get a little dieback from pruning, especially in semi-arid climates like our Mediterranean climate here in central coast of California, but across the board. Uh, and you don't want that desiccation and dieback to kill the bud. So you leave a little stub. It's just a buffer between the environment and the item, the item being your nice vegetative bud that will regrow here. You can also see I made a cut at about a 45 degree angle slanting away from the bud. And the reasoning for that is that when either irrigation rain or rain rain falls, the water sheds off and not into the bud. A lot of little tricks, and you could say, wow, what's the difference? Well, the difference can add up and be quite significant. So we find there's a lot of specificity in pruning. Here I have a branch. It's a fine branch with a nice lateral framework, but a branch I'd like a little more extension growth out of. So I'm going to head it again. The harder I cut it back into one-year-old wood, the longer and stronger it will grow. Here's my thinking. Nice branch, but what if it were two or three feet longer with a really nice set of laterals that bore fruit? If I went up two, three more feet, I might get another 10 to 20 percent more fruit off this tree than now. So I'm simply going to head it and head it quite a bit. I have a bud facing towards me. I'll just cut it to that. I expect length, strength, and lateral induction. Come back in a year's time and we'll see how we did. Let's look at shortening cuts. First, let's define terms. A shortening cut is where you cut back a branch into older wood, two-year-old and older wood. And usually for practical purposes, it's into two-year-old, maybe three-year-old wood. I've got an example here where I'm going to make a shortening cut into two-year-old wood. Let's look at some of the particulars and then explain, explain the reasoning. Pruning stub from last January's uh, that would be January of 2020. Um, it's now 2021. January 2020, heading cut, growth response. Everything lower down on the branch is two-year-old wood. But what type of branch is this? It's actually a lateral branch. So what do you want from laterals. You want weak vigor, which is somewhat of an oxymoron, I know, but that's what you want. Fruit is born best on weak to moderate growing laterals, not strong ones. This is very strong. You like strength on your big wood, your main branches. You like weakness and flatness on your secondary laterals, i.e. your fruit bearing branches. So I'm going to cut this, another thing about long laterals. Over time, they bear fruit on their tips and they tend to sag and or break. Sometimes I jokingly call them serious saggers. 
all joking aside, when a branch goes much below horizontal, it very quickly loses vigor, thus integrity. So I have developed a rationale, and I think quite sound one, for what I'm going to do here. I have a lateral that's overly long and vigorous, and I want to shorten it, that is cut it into two-year-old wood, which will effectively stop the further extension growth of that branch, semicolon, for the life of the tree. So you best be sure you want to do that, I'm sure. Looking down here, again, point of demarcation, one-year-old wood, two-year-old and older wood. I see a nice, weak, flat lateral that already has one, two fruit buds, not fully formed, but well along the way, very predictably would flower, get pollinated, and fruit next year. So I'm going to make a shortening cut to that. You could also call this a redirective cut. Let me make the cut. What we have here is a beautiful, actually exquisite, well-formed branch on an apple tree. It's long, it's strong, it has a marvelous lateral framework which will bear the fruit. And essentially we've done our job. I don't need to get any more extension growth out of it. So if you remember, you stimulate a branch to grow by heading it. If you don't want it to grow anymore, you could either leave it alone or cut it back slightly into older wood to an express fruit bud. Let me pull this branch down and look at another expression of where one-year-old wood begins and then below it, two-year-old wood. If you look here, this is an example of a branch that was not pruned. What do I see? I don't see a pruning stub, but I see this concentric ringing. And that indicates above that, one-year-old wood, new growth. Below that, two-year-old and older wood. So again, a branch that wasn't pruned, demarcation between old and new wood. I'm going to put this branch back up, and then I'm going to talk about shortening it. So I'm going to cut slightly into two-year-old wood to an express fruit bud like that. What is my expected response? I won't get any further extension growth because there isn't a vegetative bud there and I have a whole bunch of different fruit buds that will, as it were, suck up the vigor, the juices, the sugars, the nutrients, the water, and grow good fruit. But this branch it won't grow any further. So that's one way to treat an established branch. So let me just thin the unwanted branches so we can bring the picture into resolution a little more. So anything unwanted is simply removed at its base, at its point of origin here. And some of these are just perfectly fine branches, some like this one not so much or not so much. It's just you can't have too much of a good thing. Uh, and sometimes it's about the placement of the branch. For instance, if you look here, I'm going to thin this branch and keep that. Well, you might say, and you would be right, this is a stronger, longer branch. Yeah, but it's positioned just over that one. And one of the rules, as it were, is that you do not want a branch over a branch within a couple, three feet. So if I put that one on the ground, I have this one here, which is reasonable, not as good and robust as the other, but reasonable and it's got better spacing like that. So let me get on with it and remove the rest. 
<clears throat> okay, let's take the only question I have so far. Sure. And that's from Astrid, who said, on apple trees, if I cut a long one year old branch only by 25%, the lateral shoots were, will form only on the top third or so. Uh, but I want lateral growth on lower, uh, the lower on the shoot so I can keep the tree lower. What there's a conflict for her. Yeah, that makes sense? it is a pruner's dilemma. You're right. Um, uh, if you want your lateral framework, your fruit bearing laterals lower down on the tree, then you need to cut that branch back further. Now, this is a bit problematic because you're trying to keep the tree short and form laterals. Uh, so you do that because basically you're going to get two, three, four, five buds behind the lead bud that will form your, your lateral framework. Um, so you cut back more, your laterals will form lower on the tree, that's good, but you cut back more and that branch will grow longer, which is not what you want, but that's okay. You'll take the lateral formation lower down, you let that branch go. Um, you can actually take it, the new growth that's vigorous and upright, you can take it and you can train it down a little bit. The basic principle with tree growth, Upright growth is vigorous, shoots to the sky. If uh, in nature, for the age of the wood, the tree splays out and the branch goes towards horizontal, a hormonal message is sent that says, I know that's anthropomorphic, don't grow fruit. So if you as a tree trainer, move that branch down, it'll slow growth. Or you could just let that branch go. You get your nice laterals forming low down where you want them, sure. And then in a couple of years, you make a shortening cut on that extension growth at the height or the length that you want. A shortening cut into two-year-old wood, three-year-old wood will stop that branch from growing upward. That would be my suggestion. Okay, great. All right, Matt has a question. And actually, Here's the deal, or a good portion thereof. It's like these are pulsing live biological things, and it's not like you're chiseling in, in marble. So you got to have a little wiggle room. You got to go with it. You're not always going to, as the Rolling Stones once in time, you don't always get what you want. But if you try, you know how that goes. So you, you're just working with the tree the best you can. Okay. Um, okay. Um... Matt says, with an overgrown tree, I knew we'd get some of these, that produces many small medium apples, can pruning be used to achieve larger fruit size? Yeah. Um, in the, the same way to, we thin. Oops, sorry, what? Then he adds, in the same way that we thin fruit after it's set. Yeah. So um, there can be a number of reasons for small fruit. Uh, one is that you don't thin adequately. Uh, you need good spacing between fruit to size them up, uh, so do that. Um, so uh, can you improve fruit size by pruning? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it, it's simply, uh, you, you, you say you had six or eight branches and they were quite tight together. If you thinned two, three of them, you would have more flow of water and nutrients coming from the soil up into the tree, out through fewer outlets, the reduced number of branches that you retain. Therefore, there would be more flow, as it were, to the fruit on that, those branches, and they would be predictably bigger. So uh, the eliminating of branches is a good way to shuttle more juice, as it were, nutrients uh, and water into the remaining branches and get bigger fruit in tandem with thinning and in tandem with good water and nutrition. Okay, I'm gonna blast through these and then we're gonna take off. Um, a younger two to five year old tree where you're still, were you still trying to get growth and extension? Is there a standard heading cut? If you're, if you're trying to stimulate growth either with a, a young tree uh, or 
three euro branch is lagging, I would say cut it back 50% or slightly more. It's it's length, it's not its full length, it's one year old length like that. Um, and then uh, one of your goals is you want to grow the tree, fill space as quick as you can, get from the juvenile growth phase to the reproductive adult phase. Uh, so you do everything you can to stimulate a tree to grow and reach its full extent in the first handful of years, water, nutrition, sunlight, and all that, healthy leaves. Uh, but stimulating heading cuts of 50% or even more will help. OK, Elspeth wants to clarify, if we cut an established branch above a fruiting bud, it will no longer grow in in length question. That's correct. It's called a shortening cut. Cutting into two-year-old wood and or especially to an express fruit bud stops growth. Water is going to flow again from the soil up through the tree, out the branch. And instead of hitting a vegetative bud and growing, it hits a fruit bud. What you're going to get from that is what I call a fatty, a big plump fruit. There'll be a lot of flow into that fruit bud, but it will stop growth and it will pretty much stop the growth of that branch for the life of the tree. It's just a really good technique to uh, fatten up fruit, of course, but to, to limit further growth once you've reached the size tree, the height of tree that you want. Cut it back with a shortening cut into a, a fruit bud. Okay, um, a 30-year persimmon that hasn't been pruned in many years. Is the pruning process similar to an apple? <clears throat> I just say, keep up the good work. And by that, I mean, uh, you don't do need to do, and you really shouldn't do a whole lot of pruning on uh, persimmons. Uh, let me give you the example of the standard persimmons we have at the farm, which are a uh, UCSC farm, which are approaching 50 years old. Uh, we prune them as a just a gentle open center tree with heading cuts for the first handful of years. And we haven't really appreciably pruned them since, except what I call cleanup pruning, where if the branches misdirected or broken I like that we thin it out like that one thing about persimmons and you want to be careful about doing too much heading on them the way they bear the fruit is distinctly different than apples pears peaches plums apricots pluots, and the like uh, they the way they the way they go the way they grow is in you have a, a branch tip and in the spring uh, whereas on most trees the fruit buds are on two-year-old and older wood. Not so with persimmons. In the spring, that tip of that branch will put out little side shoots that will have flowers and fruit. So be careful about heading because you're essentially going to be heading off your 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 fruit wood. So a uh, little cleanup to keep the uh, the center open, a little more sunlight into the core of the tree. Uh, but one of my uh, I love persimmons, let me just say. We have the Haichia and the Fuyu. The Fuyu is the apple uh, persimmon. You can eat it firm. The Haichia, you need to let it get gooey, goppy soft. Uh, both are great. Uh, the, the Fuyu is much more natural dwarf. The Haichia, much bigger tree like that. But I refer to them as managed neglect. Plant, water, weight, eat. Uh, similarly, we haven't irrigated our persimmons at the farm after the first five or six years. They're incredibly tap-rooted. They can go down and mine for water. So I, I really wouldn't do much other than clean up pruning on persimmons. OK, we had a couple of plum questions, and I think um, you sure. just answered it. Okay. So let's, uh, let's move on. OK. OK. Uh, we're pruning, we're pruning to achieve forms. There are myriad forms. These are the two basic forms. On the left, what's called the modified central leader. On the right, which is called the open center. In a few more minutes, I'll subject you to a much shorter set of videos talking about forming uh, open center and, and MCL, a modified central leader. But uh, trees are grown to forms, geometric forms. And uh, uh, in this case, the rendering is, uh, 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 think of, uh, the open center on the right is a cone, a wide circular opening at the top and a narrow base. Flip that cone, and on the left here, you have a modified central leader, a wide base and a narrow tapering uh, tip. And uh, tree forms are all about allowing, there's two aspects to sunlight management, interception, of course, you want enough 
tree with enough branches that are spread well, go up into the sun and expose the leaves to sunlight for interception for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis results in sugars, which uh, basically forms all the cells in all the parts of the tree and gives the tree energy for work. So uh, you want good sunlight interception, but you really want good sunlight infiltration into the core or the base of the tree. And your tree form is about good spatial arrangement, branches that are spread apart and allowing shafts or alleys of light into the core of the tree. Either, even though these are kind of the opposite, a cone and an inverted cone, they both do it well. Let's go to the next slide. This was done by a former apprentice, Molly Brown, in the mid late 80s. And she went on to, she was just doing this for me. And she went on to uh, take the science illustration program at UCSC and it uh, uh, launched her into her career. She is a professional illustrator. So these are different variations on the modified central leader. And another way you could look at it is not so much the inverted cone with a wide base and a narrow tip, but a, in this case, a set of isosceles triangles where two sides are equal uh, like that. But this idea of, uh, uh, wide at the base and narrow at the top is a mechanism to get light down into the core of the tree. Uh, and then have good spacing of branches, uh, equidistant one from another around the 306 degrees of the trunk and good vertical spacing as well. Uh, and you can tell if you have enough sunlight in the core of your tree by going out. Well, one thing, do you have fruit? It takes at least 50% of the 100% of the sunlight that falls from the sky striking a branch to make and maintain good fruit buds. If you got fruit, you got enough light. If you don't, you don't. Uh, but you can go out and look, and you should go out and look at your trees in the summer and see, is there enough light in there? And if you decide there isn't, then you simply do some thinning cuts more in the top of the tree to allow some shafts of light into the core. The marvelous advantage of doing this during the summer is that you'll just see right away as you cut or thin a few branches out, the light will pour into the center of the tree and you know you got enough. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is from that book I wrote and this is uh, a step-by-step -step of how you might go about uh, pruning a uh, modified central leader tree in the early years. And I'll leave you to look at this in your leisure time after the show here and figure it out. But the idea again is you have a number of branches uh, that are separated from one another horizontally and vertically. You might have four, five, or six in one tier at the base of the tree, maybe from three to five feet. And then you have a run on the central leader, the trunk of a couple feet where there are no branches. And then you have a second weaker tier of branches up above. So you maintain that pyramidal shape. Shape. You want more branches that are longer in the lower portion of the tree, a good skip on the leader of a couple of feet where there are no branches and that allows sunlight to get on those lower branches. And then a second tier that is lesser in number and shorter in length than the lower tier branches. Again, you get yourself a nice isosceles triangle. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, just the cutest little drawing of a modified central leader with all the bells and whistles here. This is uh, an intern who thought he was doing a two credit internship and well into the quarter, he, he realized he was doing a five credit internship and he needed a project. So I sat him down in front of a few trees and uh, he had a little drawing experience, not a lot. I said, draw this. And this is what he did. So this is a beautiful modified central leader. Again, you can see here what I was talking about. You have one below the wooden spreaders, you have one tier of branches. There's one, two, three, four, five, six branches. You have a skip on the leader where there are no particular branches. And you do that by thinning out any that try to form. And then you have a second weaker tier up uh, above head high, three, four branches that are less in number again than the lower tier and shorter in length. So you have this nice uh, pyramidal shape. Shape. And here we have kind of all the bells and whistles. There are a bunch of different things you can do to train a branch. You can see these wooden spreaders here, and that simply moves a branch out and down. If a branch is too vigorous, you spread it 
towards flat. It slows down growth and increases its fruitfulness. Um, on the right, you see uh, another way to train a branch down is with a tie down. I drive a stake in the ground, tie a string around it. And on the upper left here, you see uh, uh, a little clothespin. You can use uh, cement weights. There's a whole bunch of things. And it's, a, it's an effective way to control growth. Again, upright growth is vigorous. You splay it out like that. It'll slow it down and make it fruitful. And also, if you have a whole bunch of branches that are like this, and you spread them, you get more light into the core of the tree. Uh, and then there's a little reference here of uh, uh, training a, a, a pear tree uh, in the summer that you can look at at your leisure. Let's move on. OK, you now be subject. Whoops. Uh, yeah, let's do this. A uh, little five minutes on uh, uh, show the video on uh, forming a modified central leader. Let's roll the tape. Just planted apple, Sierra Beauty, into a modified central leader. But before that, let me just critique the tree that I bought. It had a good root system, trust me. It has pretty good height, about five feet tall. It has quite a number of branches. They're reasonable to very good in their length, a little shy, a little skinny in their caliper or width. That's okay. We're going to make them strong and long by pruning them back or heading them back quite a bit, probably 50% or more of their existing length. So for the modified central leader, I want X number of branches in a tier or whorl, and then I can grow the tree up taller and create a second tier a couple years down the line. In this instance, I'm going to have one tier over this five feet or so, composed of six branches. They're tagged with white tape here. We'll get to them in a minute. And it's kind of a ascending or spiraling tier. And this is good because the more vertical spacing you have between the branches, the more sunlight that can get into the interior of the tree, keep the fruit wood lively. So there's probably 12 or 15 branches here and we'll keep only six so we'll end up with more growth through fewer outlets uh, let's look at the keepers and then i'll thin the unwanted ones and then we'll prune the keepers so starting from the bottom we have as the white tape indicates one two three four five and six and this is a goodly number not too greedy but good and again what i really like is their vertical spacing so let me just thin the unwanted branches so we can bring the picture into resolution a little more so anything unwanted is simply removed at its base at its point of origin here and some of these are just perfectly fine branches. Some like this one, not so much or not so much. It's just, you can't have too much of a good thing. Uh, and sometimes it's about the placement of the branch. For instance, if you look here, I'm going to thin this branch and keep that. Well, you might say, and you would be right, this is a stronger, longer branch. Yeah, but it's positioned just over that one. And one of the rules, as it were, is that you do not want a branch over a branch within a couple, three feet. So if I put that one on the ground, I have this one here, which is reasonable, not as good and robust as the other, but reasonable. And it's got better spacing like that. So let me get on with it and remove the rest. One thing that's critically important is I don't want a lot of branching up here next to my central leader because my effort will be to grow this up another two feet to form a second tier of branches next winter. So even if these have some redeeming qualities, their placement close to the leader makes them undesirable. So here we have the rudiments one more, of a modified central leader with a number of branches that are spread pretty good equidistant one from another horizontally and with a really marvelous ascending spiral vertical spacing. Um, 
and as you can see, no one branch is over another branch. Um, so now I'm going to address them from the top to the bottom for pruning. As I said, the harder you cut back or head back a branch in the winter, the longer and stronger the growth in the summer. One remedy for, as I mentioned, the slightly skinny branches we have on this tree this year is to prune it back hard. You get growth, yeah, but you also get thickening of the branch. So, and then you should remember that the direction of the bud that you prune to will be the direction of the resumption of growth. Generally, you want an outward and upward orientation. Uh, so I'm going to come down this branch, and I have a bud here that I'm going to cut to. I'm going to come down this branch, and similarly, I have a bud here that I'm going to cut to. I'm going to come down this branch. What did I say about rinse and repeat? <laughs> so on we go. And one more. So this is a reasonable number of branches with good both horizontal and vertical spacing, and I've cut them back approximately 50% or more of their growth. Uh, now I'm going to treat the central leader, the trunk, the central axis here, and I want to stimulate it to grow up, and as I said, a couple feet, and form a second tier, which will select the primary branches on next year. And I'm going to just prune it back here to a bud in this direction. And that's pretty much it. We're good to go. <clears throat> that was nice, Oren. <laughs> As you can see, over the last two years, we've been trying to uh, videotape the magic. And uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, let me uh, build on that. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, videographer and friend, Jim Clark, and he and I have countless uh, clips like this. We're trying to do the Orchard Almanac, all the trees around the year, young trees, big trees, etc. Uh, these are just young trees, but we have some uh, videos of uh, pruning and training established trees. Uh, went one time through the swing around the sun one year, got a lot of stuff, we didn't capture everything, so we're off and running for a second time. So let me do a little bit on open center here, and then we'll sh watch a short video. So. Um, the open center is a vase again, and the photo, which is from that book I wrote on the right, is a line of pluots, actually, uh, which is uh, a pluot is an a inner specific uh, cross between a, a plum and an apricot. It's 75% plum and 25% apricot. What it devolves to is it's a darn sweetest plum you ever ate. They're marvelous. Uh, if you're not growing any, grow some. If you're not growing any and you're not going to grow any, go to the farmer's market and get some. Uh, but you can see it's just kind of that up and out a vase or a cup, a sun cup. Um, and on the left is a rendering of how you would go through forming it. If you look at the bottom right on the illustration on the left, this is a, a four-armed open center tree that grows up and out. The, the two branches are opposing like this and two in the other direction like that to keep sunlight down into the core of the tree. And then they're headed in the winter for the first few years. They extend up, they form laterals, they're headed again, they extend up, they form laterals until you get to the point where that's enough tree, then you stop pruning and or go into uh, using shortening cuts. I think we have a short, short three minute video on doing this and, and then, uh, oh, turns out it's five minutes. Uh, all right, my, my condolences. Here we go. Let's form this beautiful young Gordon apple tree into an open center form. Open center, go like this. You just created an open center tree. Let's do it in three dimensions here now. Uh, open center is basically a cone, a wide circular opening at the top, tapering down to a narrow base. It's a sun cup. And you usually, you don't have one central leader, you have multiple leaders. So it's a very simple form with X number of multiple leaders and lateral fruit wood. Uh, X, 
X number of multiple leaders could be three, four, five, six, or seven. In this case, I've chosen to have four. So because it's not a central leader, I'm going to cut out the central leader. And then I have selected four primaries, boom, boom, going in the four directions, as it were. Um, and they are one, two, three, and four. Everything else is not needed, so I'm going to put it on the ground and thin. Again, a thinning cut is when you cut a branch out at its point of origin, leaving no, ver no real stub. So I have four branches. Again, really nice placement. That's good. The angle of the branches on this tree is not great. Now this one is, what you want with your open center is for your multiple leaders, three, four, five, six, however many you have to come up and out and into the light at about a 60, 70 degree angle. This is just about right. That's okay. Good, too flat. So let's deal with what you do with a branch that is too flat. You cut it back and you cut it back quite a bit, more than 50% of its length. And as you can see here, I'm cutting to uh, upward facing uh, bud. So that will be the direction of the resumption of growth. And let me move around and do similar cuts to the other branch, similar in the sense that I'm going to cut them back about 50% of their length. But the bud direction will vary. Um, generally, uh, I'm going to do what I'm doing here, which is I cut to an under facing bud that will resume growth out and up. Same thing here. And one more. We're done. We're good. And we've got the rudiments of a nice bowl, vase, or open center tree here. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, let's look at this. This is, uh, this is my... Uh, not quite ready for prime time uh, phone camera crew here, okay, let's uh, but it's a little bigger tree. Guys, where we are, hey, right. we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven primary scaffolds, multiple leaders. We have thinned some things that are busy in the center. We've got a nice wide open cone here, allowing light to tumble down to the core. Uh, and then I've got a few other cuts I'm going to make. Um, I'm gonna make a few heading cuts on the tops of these branches. And I want this tree, I wanna bring this tree along a little bit. I want it a little taller, maybe another two or three feet. So I'll make moderate cuts in the vicinity of 50% of the previous year's growth. If you can see this little stub here, this indicates where this tree was pruned last winter. Subsequently, this last summer, it grew there. So I'm going to cut to always an outfacing bud, always an outfacing bud, and I'm going to cut it back about half its length. I'm going to go one, two, I'll leave this one for the end. Three, four, want all branches to end in a single growth. Five, moving around. The single extension concept, head, and head. Okay. Uh, I can examine the lateral framework, lateral, 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 lateral. Laterals loaded with fruit buds. Let me do the little fruit bud litany thing here. Fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud, fruit bud. You get the picture. But I think for today's, for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to let this stuff lie. And then I have 
a little bit of training to do with this tree. Training involves the manipulating of branches. You have two options. You can let it ride high or you can bend it down towards horizontal. This is a basic plant physiology principle. Upright growth is vegetatively vigorous. It goes, grows. As a branch, either with the weight of its wood and or the weight of its fruit, bends down towards horizontal, or you, as a bud manipulator, a tree trainer, bend it down towards horizontal, it stops growing and starts fruiting. So that's one option. If something's weak, tie it up. If something's too strong, tie it or spread it down. The other aspect of tree training is horizontal movement. For instance, if two branches are too close together, that would apply here, move them. Um, some options for moving branches. <clears throat> well, that was much less TV, huh? Uh, uh, you have spreaders of different uh, types. This is very simple to make at home and pretty cheap. Redwood lath with a V-notch uh, cut in the end. And then you can purchase uh, online these metal or there's some plastic spreaders. They have a little point to the end. You can jab it into the trunk so it doesn't blow out in the wind and it does not hurt the tree. So let me just go around and talk about training these. This is a little too tight here. So I'm going to go old school, use wooden. I'm just gonna separate these a little bit. Plenty of separation, in fact, a little too much. I'm good. Uh, I've got a nice alley of light. I've got a nice alley of light. I've got a nice alley of light. I got, I got a weak branch that is too close to its neighbor. Two things I said we'd leave this to the end. I'm going to prune it very hard down to one bud to get it to grow and catch up, but I'm also going to spread it. And in fact, one of the old fashioned nicknames for this type of uh, tree, tree pruning and training is head and spread. So we did some heading and we're doing some spreading. Let's see if I could move this so it's a little more equidistant here. And the answer is, yep, pretty much. Okay, uh, that one there. Love it. Fill in space. What if we spread this just a tad like that? And then while we're at it, let's take a final look. Like I said earlier, I'm satisfied. I'm tickled too. Back to you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, are we back live now? Fruit tree growers, pseudo haiku. More. <laughs> Let's move on. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll uh, we'll just uh, take questions now. For our name. Delise, I think you're muted. All right. Thank you. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Uh, when you cut the top of a central leader, the top appears to stop growing and then sends out side branches. Is that the case? Uh, anytime you cut back a branch, whether it's a leader or a, another branch, it will regrow and behind the cut, some uh, lateral branch or branches will form. Um, if you don't in the case of a leader, as I was saying, you formed your first tier and you want the tree to grow up and then two, three feet, four feet, and then form a second tier. You don't allow those branches to form. You put all the energy into extending the leader up higher for one year. And then the next winter you head it and you'll get laterals or, or be your second tier of branches forming. Okay. Um... trying to pick which one to do. Um, have an old apple tree that was heavily pruned three years ago in response, the tree set up many vertical branches <laughs> all over, the longest of which are at the top. Uh, 
The ones at the top are about eight feet tall. I've read that you don't want to take off more than five feet of height from a tree in any one year. If I wanted to eventually remove these branches, should I cut them in half this year and the rest next year? Um, uh, don't you do it. Don't you do it. Don't you break my heart. Uh, that's a chorus from an old uh, song from Marvin Gaye before he was fully Marvin Gaye in the early 60s. Uh, but don't do that. Uh, so uh, what you when you make a, a large, a high number of cuts on a tree, it's going to stimulate the heck out of it. Apparently that's what you have there. Um, so uh, there is a way out and that is don't make any more heading cuts on that tree. Uh, look at the tree and try to imagine the tree you want, what's reasonable in terms of the number of branches and their placement in the one next to the other and their height. And then you start a process of thinning unwanted branches, but you can't do it all at once. So you, because you're doing thinning cuts uh, and you don't expect any new growth from a thinning cut, you can double up. You can prune thin in the winter and thin in the summer. So you have X number of branches you, you think you can want to take out of this tree via thinning. Do no more than 25% in winter one. Do another 25% in summer one. Do another 25% in winter two and finish it up with the last 25% the next uh, pruning session. Uh, and that'll give you, a, it'll, it'll, it'll calm the tree down. You're not making any stimulating heading cuts. You'll probably never make any more stimulating heading cuts on this tree. And another thing you can do, just do that to kind of adjust the tree so you have the right number of branches with the right spacing between them so light can get down into the core of the tree. Take you a couple of years, it's going to pay a dividend. It's well worth the wait if you proceed in a modest fashion like that. Then you can look at employing a technique that's called cutting to weakness. Do we have that slide nearby? Least, we will be getting to that and um, let's look at it right now so um, uh, the rendering on the right is uh, uh, an example of it. you just come down a branch and you look for an opportunity to lower that branch you're cutting to a weak you don't just top it you look to redirect growth from the vigorous upright to a weaker branch that comes out cants out towards the side it is by its nature and expression and by its placement flat ra rather than straight up weak and it will slow down. So you look for a number of opportunities after the two year period of pruning summer and winter, reducing the number of branches to then cut the weakness to bring down the height of the tree. And by cutting to an outward facing by, uh, branch, you will no doubt let more light into the core of the tree. So you can reduce the volume of the branches that you have created, and you can reduce the height of the tree somewhat. Now, you can't make a 28-foot tree into an 8-foot tree, but you could make a 25-foot tree into a 17-foot tree or something proportional like that. If you've got a 15-foot foot tree, you might have a shot at making it be 10 or 11 feet like that. So once you have a tree established with these heading cuts and heading cuts and training branches and thinning unwanted branches, you then just chill a little bit and you just don't make heading cuts, don't do what apparently was done. And I have some slides to show you on some trees that were handled that way. Um, and then uh, cut to weakness, uh, thin unwanted branches, and that's the deal. Let's go on uh, to look at a couple of the next trees here, I think. Uh, Yes, yeah, tree on the right is uh, a tree that uh, looks like it was pruned hard at one point five or six years ago, and then just people freaked out and walked away. So this would be a good tree to do what I just said. And again, you don't take more than about 25, 30% of the total volume you envision you could take off the tree, you want to take off the tree. You don't do more than that in one session. Let's go to the next session because it's uh, like Yikes City shot. <laughs> Yikes, city. Um, I just bought a ticket to Yikes City. So uh, this was a, 
last year or something. So, someone just took this through like Mah! like that, and you see the result in growth. And so this is an example. This is an extreme example, but uh, this this would be illustrate what I was talking about. I'm going to look at these branches, and I'm going to look at reducing maybe in the vicinity of 50% of them, and I'm going to do it by thinning them at the base. That is where the new wood meets the old wood, thin, thin, thin. And I'm going to do it incrementally over a two-year period with winter cuts and summer cuts, winter cuts and summer cuts. And then if I want to reduce the tree height and get more light into the core of the tree, I'll practice what I said is I'll look down each branch and see if I have a branch that goes out to the side. I will cut to weakness and redirect growth in that fashion. Great. We got so a you're, couple aggressive, of you're aggressive with your pruning cuts, stimulating the, the jabbers out of the tree when it's young with heading cuts and then we back off. You just do thinning cuts, maybe some shortening cuts, but don't prune an established tree heavy with heading cuts or you'll get something like this. It's fun. Keep you off the streets, not a trouble during two years, you're going to be reforming this tree, but you can probably find other things to do with your time. Are you ready for another question? Sure. Okay, we've got a couple of people who are asking about winter pruning stone fruits in this area. Uh, concern that it invites disease and um, Astrid thinks you're not supposed to do that. Um, what do you think? Uh, well, I think a lot of things, but in this instance, um, uh, conventional wisdom, which admittedly changes from time to time, uh, says, and rightfully so, don't prune apricots in the winter or in a period of rain. Uh, and uh, the reason is they're very, so the, the wound is an entry point for uh, a fungal disease called eutypa, sometimes gamosis, you have this gooey exudation from the uh, uh, branch and it can kill a branch, kill a tree. Um, so doing these pruning wound, uh, creating these pruning wounds during the wet season induces uh, uh, disease. So you generally either way, like I'm gonna say confidently, you could probably go out and prune your apricot trees right now. Well, it's a little dark, but tomorrow morning because uh, it's that old song, ain't gonna rain no more, ain't gonna rain no more, ain't gonna rain no more, pretty much, unfortunately. But it's good, so you can get in and prune your apricot trees. But often what I'll do, uh, the pattern of pruning apricots in uh, uh, certainly on the central coast here is uh, uh, wait until the fruit comes off in late June, early July, and then prune. Um, I don't see any reason to not prune other stone fruits. That would be principally peaches and nectarines, uh, and plums and pluots in the winter. Uh, the diseases that they get are not caused by uh, 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 disease entering the womb. So, but prune your apricots after they've cropped in the summer. Okay. Um, we have a request for a video on a multi, pruning a multi-grafted tree. But if you had one, would you think open center is the best uh, way to uh, yeah, uh, I'm laughing because this is a reasonable, common request. People want to know about multigrafts. Uh, I do a lot of workshops and stuff with a wonderful former student, now a colleague and partner in grind, Matthew Sutton. He runs Orchard Keepers. It's a fabulous group of you. If you're having trouble with trees or you want advice with your, for, your, for your trees, whether you're in the planning or the mid stages of, of growing trees, uh, orchardkeepers.com. You couldn't meet a more talented and nicer group of people. But he and I both hate multi crafted trees. <laughs> so we always like toss the question to the other guy. But and he's not here tonight, so I'll handle it. Um, it's actually a good thing for the small backdoor grower where you don't have a lot of space. You can get an apple or pear that has three or four varieties. You just lengthen the, uh, the, the cropping season, the eating season, and you get a diversity of varieties. Um, and you can do the same thing with uh, peaches and plum stone fruits. They even have what they call a fruit cocktail tree, which is one of them will be a peach, one of them will be a plum, one will be an apricot, one will be a cherry. Um, and it, they're uh, kind of a, a feasible thing for people with small spaces, but you must prune them 
to an open center. And you must keep all the original branches because each original branch is an, a distinct variety or species. Um, so uh, it's just much more practical to train them to an open base uh, than to a leader tree uh, like that. One of the problems with multigraphs is that for some reason, they seem to, <clears throat> I'm gonna say, delight in putting, grafting onto the tree varieties that are really disparate vigor. So you get something like Mutsu, which is a monster, or Fuji, which is a tsunami, and something like Golden Delicious, which is moderate to maybe a little weak, and something like Cactus Orange Pippin, which is ridiculously weak. So you get an unbalanced tree, and in some cases, the weaker branches will die out. So you step down from having four to three or two varieties. So uh, look for uh, multigraphs that have varieties that are of the same approximate vigor. And that's easily attained. You, you can find that out by reading the, the varietal tags or looking it up online. What is the vigor of Mutsu? What is the vigor of Cox's orange pippin, et cetera? But they're a good, good home gardener's solution. Another alternative, which is a little pricey at the outset, but I actually kind of like it better, is to plant two, three, four trees in the same hole. Uh, and uh, get trees again that are of equal vigor, uh, and you plant them so that their stems are, the trunks are canted out like this, so you're forming a nice open bowl or open center tree. Uh, so you might have three or four uh, trees, it's gonna cost you 120, 150 bucks, but yeah, it's gonna pay off in down the line when you eat fruit over, well, say with an apple over 75 to 100 years, uh, sure. Finally, we have a question about your preference between dormant pruning and midsummer pruning. Uh, yes, I like them both. Uh, let me make an analogy here. Uh, you get going and you form the initial framework of the tree with winter pruning. It's in, in general, it's it stimulates, heading cuts stimulate. Uh, and then you refine that with summer pruning. You could make the, the analogy I'm gonna make is building a house. Uh, winter pruning, is pouring this concrete slab, put, putting up the framing, the siding, and the roof. Summer pruning is you moved inside, you're doing the tile work, the cabinetry, the mold like that. So you get the basic form of the tree, its extent and uh, uh, spacing of the branches through heading and spreading training in the winter. And then uh, you can uh, control tree size and you can induce a lot of fruit bearing on laterals with summer pruning. We actually have a couple of videos on this and I'll see if I can get with Jim and we can kind of route them in your direction. And we'll be doing a few more this summer. Uh, I will say uh, <clears throat> immodestly that my book, uh, Fruit Trees for Every Garden has a considerable section on summer pruning as well as winter pruning. In fact, when I presented the pruning chapter to the publisher, their eyes went agog, looked like slot machines. It was, it's ginormous. And I said, yeah, if you look at any pomology textbook, about 20, 25% of the page total would be devoted to, to pruning. And if you think of it in the end run, you're probably gonna do more pruning and training on your trees than you will all the other activities that you will be engaged in with your trees over the course of their lives cumulatively. Uh, so it's something to study up on and, and it can seem daunting and overwhelming, uh, but if you set yourself down and plant a few trees, get some sort of good information uh, and proceed, it's kind of like a conversation with a tree over time. You do this, the tree does that, you come back and do this, um, and you can see these principles, heading cuts, shortening cuts, tree form, come a cropper as it were. Yeah, that, that kind of where I see where I'm going like that. And um, the other thing about uh, pruning is the learning curve is kind of slow, long. And why is that? Because you only really do it once a year. And in order to do something, you got to do it a lot. So it does take longer to get a good skill set with pruning than you know, heck radishes. You can sow them every week. You know, you're good at it real quick. So there you go. Great. Shall we go through the uh, coming next slides? Yes. Upcom upcoming workshops. Yeah. Uh, so in March, 
We're working on a beekeeping class. Uh, we're going to be doing a virtual one that's accessibly priced at five dollars <clears throat> and one that's hands on that will probably be at the homeless garden. Um, Emily Bondor has been working with Oren in the up garden at the university and helping with the honeybees there. So she's awesome. Yeah, she let me let me give a plug for Emily and also her partner, her bee partner, Connor McNulty. They uh, We've just, uh, during the COVID here, we hadn't had anybody take care of bees. We lost all our bees and they are turning the situation around big time. And they're, they're two really uh, uh, just nascent beekeepers. I mean, they're skilled enough, but they're just on the upswing. And you couldn't meet more bouncy, upbeat people and both of Emily and, Con uh, uh, and Connor. Uh, and then the second uh, workshop, the go for control, uh, is something usually standing room only. Uh, everybody's got gophers and Thomas Whitman is uh, amazing. He was one of the founders. Uh, 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 he was one of the people initially in on perfecting the art of dry farm tomatoes on the Central Coast here. Uh, subsequently for 10 years, he was our maintenance individual. He went out on his own and he's uh, uh, the sweetest guy who can come and get rid of your gophers. He's very methodical in his approach to it and can teach you how to do it. Great. Uh, we have hit the end of our time. We're in fact over a couple of minutes. Could you just, um, uh, Jessica, click through the last few slides so folks know. We, um, yeah, could I speak to this one? Please do, please do. So uh, this is a, shout out and an acknowledgement, uh, an, an acknowledgement with a little bit of shame and a ton of honor. The land that UCSC is on is land that is occupied. Uh, and it's land that for eight to 12,000 years, the progenitors, the ancestors of the Amamutsin tribal band walked this land, lived on this land, shepherded and stewarded this land with a high degree of ecological wherewithal and knowledge until they were wrongly taken from their land in the 1700s and taken to the missions at Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. This had totally disrupted their culture. And yet they're on the rebound and they're relearning, reclaiming the land in the area. Uh, you should support them. You should support them with generous donations. You should support them by joining their work parties and work days. And at the Arboretum on campus, they have what they're calling a relearning garden where they're growing plants and talking about the native uses of them. Uh, and they have periodic workshops. So uh, do the right thing. I just wanted to show uh, Oren's book cover so you know what you're looking at when you go to buy it. Next. This yeah, that's, actually, that, that's actually the paw of my uh, colleague, Christoph Bernal, who manages the uh, farm garden. <laughs> he told me he needs to get an agent. Um, and uh, that is a beautiful uh, Indian blood peach. Uh, it's just beautiful. It was actually grown by the Cherokee Nation. Um, and uh, the book is good. It's really quite chock full of information. To me, the best part of the book is my wife, Stephanie Martin, did uh, a series of uh, intaglio copper plate etchings, about 10 or so that are in the book and all the illustrations. So check it out. Um, there's another book. Is, uh, is this yeah. one out of this is a great book. Uh, Chuck Ingalls was the principal. Others uh, were involved. And unfortunately, Chuck passed away a couple of years ago. But he was such a, a, both a friendly, outgoing, and knowledgeable tree grower. He was a UC Extension agent. And he was able to convince UC to let him deal with home gardeners. And by and large, UC Extension agents don't do that. Uh, and it's a, I use this book still. I use this book all the time. It's only 25 bucks or something ridiculous like that's really good. And I just wanted to let everybody know that when we send the, uh, we're gonna send out the slides and we're gonna send out the recording, but you'll have links to all the videos we saw and a few more that you did not have time to watch. So thank you everybody for being on the call. Yeah, um, I, wanna, I wanna thank folks for hanging in there and 
I acknowledge it's a really funky and clunky way to do this, but it's the best we can do right now. But please look for whenever we can assemble without masks and get close together so we can look at buds on a tree. We'll do it real. We'll do it live and we'll do it right. And I always have to argue with Oren. Everybody has a front row seat. Everybody can see what he's doing. Everybody You're right. The well, great thing about uh, Zoom is total access. You're right. And hundreds of people can attend. It's it's got benefits. Right. But we'll we'll be in person soon. So thank you all. Thank you, Oren. All right. Thank you all very much. Bye.